Okay, so um, before I begin, a few apologies. Um, yet again, I've changed uh, the title of my presentation. <laughs> I do hesitate to say that that is not official TJI policy, <laughs> um, even though most of us have done it this week. This week. So um, also, um, there's far too many slides here. Well, I just I'm going to skip through a lot of them and assume a lot of kind of pre-existing knowledge. But if anyone is interested in some of the things, they can obviously go back and look at those. So okay, so. Um, structural violence, um, again, I'll assume a bit of knowledge of this. Um, violence is a causal mechanism. Um, it can be direct or structural. Um, structural is without that direct uh, subject object uh, action relation. Um, so, but it's still uh, a form of violence. I'll get into that a bit more. Here's a few more quotes about it. I'll skip those. Um, okay, this is one I like more because it's shorter. Uh, so structural violence, ongoing experience of social marginalization, political exclusion, and economic exploitation, um, all of which may or may not exist in Colombia. The Colombians can tell us more, but I would say probably all of them. Um, okay, so that's kind of built into social structures, um, a lot to do with the power relations, um, and the, poli the local politics, and obviously economic inequalities um, do exist. Um, that links to the idea of armed conflict in many ways, and obviously in a political settlement in the post-conflict, because structural violence can give us a focus that goes beyond just kind of uh, certain violations, certain incidents, and you look more at the, the under, uh, under, underpinning structures, um, especially as these are often exacerbated during armed conflict, uh, and they don't disappear. Okay, structural violence in Colombia, uh, it's a colonial state, Kind of based on kind of alienation of, uh, of the inhabitants from the land uh, that continued in the post-independence period. Um, they even have kind of got worse. I don't think the Gini coefficient goes back to the 1800s, uh, so never be able to tell. Um, and the social and economic context of armed conflict is, is very important, especially if you look at the areas in which, um, for example, the, the, the FARC um, guerrilla began. Uh, and they were very much in areas that had been exposed to massive structural violence and direct violence before that, um, from the La Violencia before that, before that the, the war between liberals and, and conservatives. Um, and obviously land remains an important economic and political resource. Um, so a few other things with structural violence. So, I mean, even, even now, obviously there's still armed conflict going on, but I did find a snazzy graph, but I couldn't find it uh, today or yesterday when I was looking for it, which is basically how many homicides are actually conflict related as like a very small fraction of the overall homicide. So even as a measure of direct violence, the armed conflict is not the main problem of direct interpersonal violence. And it's uh, and even before we look at the structural violence. So things like uh, the massively um, unequal uh, society, 11th globally, um, if you look at the property, um, Gini, that's not what it is, that's massively high, obviously. Um, human development indicators when we factor in inequality drop by a quarter, and as a massive gap in, that's one example of the reproductive and maternal health. Um, the gap is 13% between those with no education and those with higher level education. That's a graph that says basically the same, but in a fancy way. Um, <laughs> I'm stuck over here, I don't even know what it means. <coughs> I should probably have got a citation for that, to be honest, it wasn't mine. Uh, okay, so transitional justice, again, I'm going to assume a bit of knowledge about that. Uh, the main processes, justice, truth, reparations, institutional reform, guarantee of non-recurrence. Um, looking, I'm more interested at the limitations. Okay, I always sound really negative. Um, because, well, I'd say cynical rather than negative, but hey, let's not split hairs. Um, but there is a role for transitional justice, I do, I do um, say that, and not just because I'm in the Transitional Justice Institute, although that does uh, somewhat influence. But uh, I do feel there's massive uh, limitations conceptually, ideologically, methodologically, in terms of uh, temporality and, uh, and individual. Um, so I'm looking at more kind of transformative justice which is trying to take the structural violence that's, that I'm interested in more seriously, kind of drawing, drawing a line from the past to the, to the future, recognizing the past returns in the future. Um, you can't really deal with the past 
in, in a kind of classic transitional justice manner. I know transitional justice um, kind of discourse has moved on from that uh, somewhat simplistic um, manner, but to some extent it's still stuck in a, in a legalistic paradigm and a short-term paradigm. Um, okay, here's another snazzy graphic this is from the citation. Um, Matthew Edmund is showing some of the, <coughs> basically in the middle, showing what can overlap um, from the transitional to the transformative, okay, in terms of what we're interested in. Um, Evans actually regards them as totally different paradigms that can't be used um, to um, interchangeably or used to kind of influence each other. I would actually dispute that. I would say it's more of an evolution. Uh, Wendy Lamborn gives principles of too much. This is just about context specificity. Uh, this is some of the same idea, so I'll, I'll skip over that. Um, so again, you know, there's a debate again about is transformative justice new? Is it evolved? Transitional justice has already evolved, and someone like really would say, um, Sandra Wall would say more could be done with transitional justice. Um, obviously, Waldorf is, uh, no, let's just prosecute people. You know, that's, uh, that's it. That's what we can do. Um, but then even he admits that it's not even very successful at that. So if you're saying we should just keep something very limited, because otherwise you'd overburden it, and then in the next kind of paragraph, you admit that that doesn't actually work anyway, then it, it leaves very little scope for it to be anything. Oh, wow, well, we can go two more than halfway through. Um, and better go back and talk about some of these. See, this was going to happen. Um, okay, so good. This is now the new bit of my presentation, so you all very, uh, should all feel very privileged. So that, um, the first people beyond my um, supervisor and ethical review board that have uh, seen this next bit, so... Uh, you know, excitement. Um, okay, so transformative justice. Um, so, you know, it's quite a new framework, so it's um, it's still quite nebulous, obviously. So th there's a lot of kind of critique in it, and I do the same. I'm like, oh, yeah, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that. Um, it should do better, uh, and then very little on what it should do to do things better specifically. So what I've been working on is trying to kind of do some, create a bit of a matrix that I feel initiatives to be transformative justice, to reduce structural violence, should contain. Uh, I've come up with the idea that they should operate in, on three dimensions um, as a diagnostic. So taking the structural violence seriously when elaborating initiatives. Um, so we're talking about the historical roots, the political economy, um, political factors, uh, obviously the society, um, obviously like um, context specific, which is great, but it's actually, Having heard it so much recently, I feel it's now becoming a new, the new buzzword, isn't it? You know, the local context. So um, moving on into process requirements. So, you know, it's all very well to say this is going to have positive impacts on people, but that should very much include people both in the diagnosis, but also in the implementation, in the design of the initiative. So, you know, in, so things that could include capacity building, because obviously the reality is the main not be capacity or or, or, or ability to um, to take part um, meaningfully. So that needs to be done. But um, I feel this is an important, a very important stage of the process because the idea is not just participation within the initiatives or any program because you know it could be a great program. People could be very you know participate a lot. After four years, it finishes. But you know what have you created from that? Are people then empowered? To kind of participate more in the local society in continuing projects and maybe bringing on that project when the international funding or the domestic funding runs out can they bring that along by themselves with local skills um does it empower them to to um to then participate maybe in local uh, politics which is um obviously something important and then the outcome requirements which would require both the tangible and the intangible um, which is a really very good, um, I love that iceberg model um, that, um, that Colleen and um, Natalia had earlier so, um, so, that, yeah, so I, really, I really like that kind of idea so both the tangible positive change of in the case of, of my initials of a lab, okay I too long again. Back on, <laughs> back on the track of having too much to say. Okay, so, um, so I've tried to get these more specific kind of um, 
indicators that I got in. I wouldn't really call them indicators, it was just questions to ask at those different stages. So what sort of people, what sort of groups were involved in elaborating the documents that the initiatives are based on, um, what causes do they ascribe it? So if I think structural violence is a problem, the initiative doesn't say structural violence is a problem. It just says, okay, the problem is um, Juan went and he killed 40 people. That's a problem. And say, well, is that the problem? Is that the only problem that we're trying to deal with? Uh, so what sort of aims are looking for? to it's just specific focus on inequalities, on inclusion, exclusion, um, to design and process ideas. Um, what is the role of beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries in terms of non-direct beneficiaries in, uh, in terms of um, restitution of land? Uh, that's, that's what I mean by that. People who benefit from that, but also people who don't benefit from that directly. Um, are they representative? How do, we part how do we ensure that participation? Is it meaningful? Are there practical um, obstacles to it? Um, outcomes. So again, some of the things I was saying, increasing kind of overall mobilization, participation, empowerment, uh, politically, socio-politically. doesn't have to be directly political organizations, but kind of having the confidence to participate in local community organizations. Direct violence. Um, should be less killings, kidnapping threats if you reduce structural violence, although I recognize that may not necessarily be true because obviously um, people with access to violent, violent means could obviously react against that by, by causing more violence in an exemplary fashion. So I do need, I have considered that. And then kind of outcomes, again, broad ownership of land, uh, things like that, um, da, 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 improved access to health, schooling, uh, things like that. Okay, so my research question, which I like to put at the end, but at the beginning. <laughs> Why not? So um, basically all of that's got me to here, which is what, I'm, what, what I want to do, and which is why some of those questions were quite specific about land, because I want to investigate whether the land restitution program or peasant reserve zones, um, which I haven't explained, but read my paper if you want to know, <laughs> um, uh, whether they reduce structural violence and some of the methods, just, just throwing the kitchen sink at it basically, um, looking at the text to see you know, what the, 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 the policy documents, whether they take the structural violence seriously. I want to look at some data sets in terms of um, kind of indicators of um, um, ed access to education, uh, literacy level, things like that, interviews with and then the most important part would be the interviews with peasants in three sites, one with experience of each initiative and one at a, at a control site. So that's my Twitter, etc. etc. Okay. Thank you very much.